Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to wish everyone a happy Father's Day. To those who are fathers, soon to be fathers, wish to be fathers, grandfathers, great grandfathers, and even uncles who have acted as father figures in people's lives. Anyone who's ever acted as that father figure role for someone in a tremendous way. And I want to mention this will be my second Father's Day. <laughs> Olivia likes to pick, is already picking on me about that. She's like, it's not fair, you already get your second one. I'm like, well, you should have told that baby to wait a little longer. <laughs> baby didn't want to wait. So last week we reflected on that church's role of fostering growth in the church body how it must consider its unique position in the 21st century as it raises that next generation of kids in the church. And so I find it pretty fitting that today is Father's Day so we continue on this theme. And so today we're going to celebrate fathers today and how they've raised kids through hard work, determination, and through their wisdom. And so first we're going to go to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 4 specifically. And in this reading, we will see King Solomon speaking to his sons, speaking on this woman named Lady Wisdom. Now, Lady Wisdom is just a literary personification of God's wisdom and how they will need to hold on to it for the rest of their lives and allow that wisdom of God to foster in their lives if they're going to grow, if they're going to be able to grow and to stay humble and to stay focused on the story of their lives and how God has intended for that story of their lives to unfold. He requests that they listen to his instruction because it's not these just empty words of just a father, you know, just telling them, well, when I was a boy, you know, <laughs> but these genuine thoughts of what was passed from his father down to what he saw in his own life that worked. And he wants to make sure that they can at least skip some of the things that you can at least stay out of trouble from. And so this isn't just a desire to be some power of an, or an authoritarian father or son. No, these are authoritative words. And that's the difference. They're authoritative. His words carry weight for his sons. And that means that they have the gift of life in them. And we'll see what I mean in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. Proverbs Chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. I did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, children, to a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, Tender and my mother's favorite, he taught me and said to me, and it starts as a quote, Let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget or turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, and whatever else you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a fair garland, and she will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Hear, my child, and accept my words. That the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. If you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction, do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it, do not go on it. Turn away from it, and pass on. And so, Solomon starts his passage. By the first thing he does is he makes sure his sons are paying attention. He says... And I quote, listen, children, to a father's instruction. It's a very nice way of putting it. I can imagine what my dad would say instead. 
And he admonishes to them that they are to listen to his instruction and pay attention so they might gain insight from his word. And he says that he gives good precepts. Now, a lot of this proverb is a little cryptic, and that's what I'm going to try to break down, is what this actually, how we might understand it. And so what does he mean by precepts? Well, precept just means a commandment, an authoritative rule for action. And in many scriptures that we have, it means a generally, if coming from God, a divine injunction, which man's obligation is set forth. And injunction is just a command from God or an authoritative law. And so these are basically, he's giving them a compass, in a sense, to guide how they might live. When they're at a crossroads on a decision, he is saying, seek wisdom. Sometimes when we think of, if you've ever heard the word precepts in scripture, you might think of Isaiah chapter 28, verse 10. For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. And this might help us get a little bit more insight about what is going on here. And while now, what in this case is Isaiah talking about? If you've heard this verse before, in this case, Isaiah is talking about how God's wisdom builds upon itself over time in one's journey. As one starts to understand the wisdom of God, this isn't like a one-stop shop. You, which I've said that before, <laughs> too. You don't just get baptized and everything flushes to you, and all of a sudden, I understand God. <laughs> that happened multiple times, actually, for um, even the apostles. Multiple times, they realized things. They had things revealed to them beyond the veil. At his ascension, we read that they had things revealed to them. But, he, but again, at we go to Pentecost Sunday. Again, their hearts were on fire. They had tongues of flame over them. And again, things were revealed to them through the Spirit. But things were revealed to them before the Spirit, too. So that you have this conundrum in Scripture where while they have their eyes open, it was just a layer that was opened. <laughs> because we're not God. We can't see the whole picture. We're only being given the picture God is for us. We're given an imperfect um, clarity, so to speak. And so no matter what we ever have, it's not going to be the full picture. And that's the struggle, is accepting that God is always in, in this sense of full control. We have to give up some sort of autonomy, so to speak, when we accept Christ. That's a struggle. Because we like to think in American terms of free will, freedom, whatever, right? And we really like our individuality and all these things. But it's like once you become the body of Christ, it's like that is not how things really work anymore. It's no longer about just you. And now you, you've become a part of Christ's body. Now Christ is calling you to a mission. And it's really hard to set aside your ego. And so we realize that God's truth really is not revealed all at once. You take it like a kid who has to chew his food. I see this through em emory. You know, starting with formula. Then you get to solid foods and so forth. Getting where they get to tougher and tougher foods. By the time, like she's cutting molars now. So eventually she'll be able to, yeah, it's not fun. <laughs> so eventually she'll be able to chew like really tough stuff. You know, you know it's like, obviously you don't want to give really tough steak to a one-year-old who might choke on it because her molars weren't there to chew that up, that grisly stuff up yet. That would be like, you could think of steak being like the really tough theological stuff, stuff the meaty stuff that we, us seminary people like to argue about all day. <laughs> but um, that's kind of the uh, example I'm trying to give here. And so in our case, it's that, it's that our adult understanding of Scripture comes in. And this is why we hear things like Paul talking about the old law being a school teacher, and why Christ wasn't really fully revealed in the beginning of Scripture. Well, yes, we have this idea of logos, you know, the Word, and that Christ was in the Word. He certainly was in the Word. But <clears throat> if you were in that time, no one knew Christ. 
in the sense of like saying they knew his name until he revealed himself in the incarnation. We have this idea that, you know, in dreams people might have met him, but they didn't know his name. And so they were convinced they had it, but, but there's this hint of this idea in Isaiah because everywhere, like in Jeremiah and Isaiah, when they start to talk about the Son of Man, well, who's the Son of Man? And that's where we start to look back in the Old Testament and say, well, we have hindsight 2020. It's like, well, obviously that's Christ, the Son of Man. We call him the Son of Man in the New Testament. Obviously that's the Son of Man, the King of Kings. Of course it is. Well, how would they have been? So obviously for them, God's wisdom is revealed over time. Just like how he revealed his laws over time. His laws changed over time in their multiple covenants. And so for context, in this scripture, I'm, just this little scripture in the segue, is that Isaiah is actually in this long scripture where he's making this point. He's speaking and declaring doom to Ephraim and Judah, which Ephraim just did the northern uh, part of Israel. He's speaking of their drunkenness and their pride and their doom. He's declaring their doom because they were convinced that they had everything they needed. They, they were knowledgeable. They thought they knew the world. They didn't need me. But God wasn't done. God had much more plans for them, but they kind of rushed God aside and was just doing whatever they wanted. They had set in their ways, and they kind of get stuck in their, their rules, and then that's just it. God had much more revealed. I do want to take a step back. This is not me saying that we do not believe that Scripture doesn't have everything that is necessary and sufficient for salvation. I just realized when I just said not in my mind. <laughs> um, I'm saying that Scripture does have everything that is sufficient for salvation and necessary. We have all the revealed Scripture that we need. There's nothing to add or take away from it. But how God applies this revelation into our own lives, how, this, how we start to, in our own lives over time, start to understand Scripture changes. Because I can tell you from my own personal understanding, the past year, me getting to see how Scripture has played out, or my understanding of Scripture has wildly changed, just in a lot of ways, just in the way of understanding what it means for God to be the manifestation of love, for God to be that father figure. What does it mean for God to be the original father of him? What does the Trinity actually mean? Like when I started talking about these relationships. I didn't understand these relationships 10 years ago. I, I still don't understand them now, but I understand more than I did 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I didn't even know what an epistle was. <laughs> I didn't even realize that like Romans was a letter. I just thought it was a the Bible. Like, that, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Like, that's what I mean by revelation. And so it's like the journey with the Bible. It's like the Bible is static in that sense, but the Word itself is, goes on a journey with you. You, throughout your entire life, will find that the Father in Heaven will be constantly disciplining you through the Word and will constantly be giving you this, these ideas and teaching you through it. And so with that aside, what precepts mean? <laughs> you get back to Psalm. He gives us wisdom that will help them to continue on their own lives. And he makes some major points that were kind of difficult to tease out and understand. But they're very important. And so in verse 4, so I, I kind of got a number out here of how I understood them after reading um, commentaries and stuff. So in verse 4-4, four, four, and these are my paraphrases. He says, let your heart hold fast to these words. By keeping these rules, you may find meaning in life. Verse 4, 5. Wisdom and insight. These are the two things of primary importance for seeking. Do not forget any of the words of my mouth, and do not turn away from me. 4, 6. Do not forsake wisdom. Actually, love wisdom, for she will guard you and keep you. And 4-7, which was the toughest one, so this one's kind of an explanation to help with how it kind of seems circular. You will obtain wisdom 
simply by seeking wisdom. Above all else things, for anything else you receive in life, let yourself receive insight from that thing. If you, for eight, if you prize wisdom like you would the greatest gift on earth, you will be held in high regard. You will be honored if you embrace wisdom. You'll be honored by wisdom. Wisdom will hold its side of the bargain. Wisdom will give you that insight. Now, will it give you the insight you want? Maybe not. Will it only give you like a tiny bit? The return may not be what you want it to be. It may be like the wisdom is to stop trying to figure out what's going on. But that may be the wisdom. Wisdom does not mean intelligence. That's the thing that we struggle with is that godly wisdom does not mean intelligence. <laughs> does not mean knowledge in that, oh, I, now I know how the stars work or things like that. No, sometimes it just means knowing when to know and let go on something. And then it finally says, wisdom, because all of this, you put a beautiful crown on your head. And I was like, well, what do they mean by a crown? So I had to look this one up. It's a crown of gray hair. It's an example of your longevity. And this gives to Proverbs 16.31, where this reference comes in. In Proverbs 16.31, it says, gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. Well, I would say my grandma would disagree with that one. <laughs> she always dyed her hair red consistently throughout her entire life. I was just talking about how she, her, to Missy, how her, one of her bathrooms was all red. Well, her hair was also red. <laughs> <laughs> Long story, but she loved red. She was Irish, and she refused. She's like, that was the one thing she was not going to let go was that her hair. So... <laughs> But that's the point. And so that was just kind of one of the proverbs they have there. And so what a beautiful set of general rules on wisdom that anyone can follow. The point he's kind of trying to get here is that if you are willing to just sort of let this idea of wisdom, godly wisdom, to kind of overtake your life, humble yourself, and stop trying to take all these like, oh, I need to go follow this guy's rules or those guy's rules, or I need to do this or that, and just... Seek wisdom first in, in and of itself, which probably does mean scripture. He probably is suggesting scripture. I don't know. That's kind of the difficulty. What does he mean by seeking wisdom in and of itself? I think that's kind of, he might be leaving that up in, for interpretation for his sons. I'm not sure. Um, but the point is that I think there, the point is, is that openness to see a situation, whatever it is, for everything that it is, and trying to find what is. If, if you only see two solutions, is there a third option? Because you, you'll see it like when uh, Christ talks in his Beatitudes or when Christ gives these examples of, um, let's see, his examples of, um, instead of being passive in violent situations, he's not exactly a pacifist. He's actually what a uh, Bible project calls, I'm trying to think of a term, creative Creative something. So instead of, for example, you know, when someone slaps you in the face, he says to turn the other cheek. The reason he says to turn the other cheek is because they're slapping you with the backhand, which is a, is a sign of, that you're underneath them. But if you turn the other cheek and they slap you the other way, they have to slap you with the, the other side of the hand because they always slap, at least in that time, they would always slap with the, the right hand. They would have to slap you as an equal. <laughs> that was an interesting thing, I think. Now that probably doesn't necessarily, so he's trying to come up with these creative things or like, you know, if someone asks you to carry something, go a second mile. I learned that apparently in Roman times that you have, that Roman soldiers could require you to go the first mile. But if you offer to go the second mile, that meant they had to regard you to accept that as you offering to offer them help. And so then they had to scratch their head and be like, why are they offering to help me? And so then you are breaking the mold and saying, well, I'm just going to help you. Well, what kind of, that's a pretty aggressive, like, non-violent, that's like, that's aggressive friendliness, I guess you could say. It's like, instead of punching someone in the face, I'm just going to aggressively help you until you can't take it no more. <laughs> and then everyone's going to see those soldiers and this person aggressively helping them, and they're like, well, what 
wait a minute, are those soldiers helping him, making him walk that second mile? They can't do that. That was kind of the, now I don't know, but that was kind of the one thing I don't know if I agreed with was this idea of setting these people up like that, but that was kind of the, the point is that you go the extra mile because that shows the injustice. Instead of making bad reactions to situations, because what happens is, and this is what I always did when I was younger, is I would react worse to situations. And this is something my dad taught me all the time. He's like, your reaction to a situation is worse than the situation. And so no one sees the situation you're reacting to because we're all staring at you having a tantrum. <laughs> so there is wisdom in the Beatitudes. There is wisdom in what Christ is saying. And I'm like, and here I am listening to the Bible Project talk about this. And I'm like, oh, now I find it. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> and so, we'll finally close this up with uh, the story of the prodigal son. Because just because you have wisdom does not mean that everything goes right. You actually look through, Proverbs is just one of three books of wisdom. The second being Ecclesiastes. Oh my gosh, that's a brutal one. And if that's not harsh enough for you, go read Job. That's supposed to be a book of wisdom. A book of wisdom. It's not a book of, it's not a story book. It's supposed to be a book of wisdom. And I'm like, that's a book of wisdom? Yikes. So we'll go to uh, the story of the prodigal son now, which that is in, I got my paper fell away. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. 11 through 32, and I'll get us through that pretty quick. 11 through 32, Luke chapter 15. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and a younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. So he divided his assets between them. And after not many days, the younger son gathered everything and went on a journey to a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth by living wastefully. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine throughout the country, and he began to be in need. And he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to tend pigs, and he was longing to fill his stomach with the carob pods that the pigs were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have an abundance of food? And I am dying of tears and hunger. I will set out and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. And he set out and came to his own father. But while he was still a long way away, his father's son, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf. Kill it and let us eat and celebrate, because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and, they, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the slaves and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's back to that healthy. But he became angry and did not want to go in. So his father came out and began to implore him. But he answered, and he said to his father, Behold, so many years I have served you, and have never disobeyed your command, and you never gave me a young goat so I could go celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned, who has consumed your assets with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for, for gold. I guess it ends there. Then I'll pick the one I did. And then it goes on, and you know, they, they kind of argue back and forth, and then the older, it's not clear if the older son ever comes back, but he's pretty upset about this. The point is, is that, thank Christ.
Christ, and even if we squander the wisdom passed from tradition, we have Christ and that Father from heaven who accepts us with open arms and gives us a second chance. Despite all the wisdom we're given, we can come back with a second chance. In the same fashion, in this story, a father who chooses not because he loves one over the other, but because he has that Christ-like love and a desire to fix a broken family, he feels the void, and the void gets bigger and bigger. He desires reconciliation. And we have many stories of these in our lives, where people remember nuggets of wisdom in their early their lives, how good things were when they were younger, what their dads taught them that helped them, or father figures taught them to fight through the lows in life that eventually turned them back to Christ because of one thing that taught them. I personally celebrate this story because I felt it with the major periods of spiritual apathy and dryness I had during college. Having my father and grandfather be these representations of what it means to have an everyday faith and that one cares about family, one spends one life not in material wealth, but in the joy of spending time with others and staying in touch. Those are the memories that kept me linked when I was furthest away. These were the bindings that helped shepherd me back. They kept a strong foundation that wouldn't let me go. My parents never loved me based on the strength of my faith in that sense. I got to see every day that average representation of faith in everyday life. So I understood what Christ's image was in a normal life. Where you don't get thank yous, no one notices, but you do keep things peaceful. You become peacemakers, and you're just an average Joe, just a contributing to the world without being that you know, person on stage trying to be the showy person. Even if our negativity bias makes it hard to know us, notice. I used to think my parents were just average, everyday parents, you know, that everyone was just supposed to have. I had no idea, well, I never realized until I got into um, grade school how good I had it. Had no idea how good I had it with my dad. Had no idea how good I had it that, you know, I never had a broken home. That I had three brothers that, despite how much they drove me nuts, that I had three brothers who, you know, never ran out of the house or ran away or anything crazy like that. But like, we were, despite all of our problems, we were pretty okay. <laughs> I thought that was the average experience. No, it was not. That was not what I witnessed when I went to East Dale. That was just not what I witnessed. It was just not what I witnessed. What I witnessed was more accurate and akin to what um, the singer from For Today and his lyrics for his um, song Fatherless goes. When he says, I was just an angry kid going without a dad. I sold my soul for the highest bidder to get that love I never had. Tell me who I am. A kid who turned to the world for identity. But it was never me I was looking for. It was actually always him. And that him he's talking about is that father in heaven. He's talking about how he's fatherless. And he's talking about how it turns out that, well, you know, he's obviously not the same having an actual father figure, you know, physically in front of you, that that father in heaven can somehow supplant that void. I, I never will have to experience that suffering. I can't understand it. I can't totally appreciate it. But I know that many people for Father's Day have to struggle with that each time. And so anyone who has to struggle with it, I invite, you know, to welcome the Father in their hearts to think about how much that might help. I know that can be a thing that's tough to even ask. It's a hard ask because I can't totally appreciate that pain. But even when my dad's not around, some, it's like, and isn't available to help me with every little thing now. You know, I'm on my own, gotta be an adult now. Who's there? Christ. The point is, despite all the arguments in our families, our teasing, our grumpiness, our attitudes, whatever it is that we struggle with, we're all just trying to figure this world out. Fathers everywhere we've witnessed have worked diligently to raise kids to the best of their ability. 
working, I've seen some working multiple jobs. I've seen some who are single fathers. I've seen some who've taken time off to watch kids. Sometimes they'll sacrifice hours that they need to pay bills to watch their kids because they just don't have that extended family network. Maybe even raising them in that family home I mentioned. We desperately need these fathers in our lives to set these good examples that we were just talking about for our sons and daughters. I've seen what a world without dads causes. I cannot imagine where I'd be without my dad. I don't know what Emory's life would look like if I just disappeared. The idea of that gives me chills and not the good time, the good time. There are many of us who have had the grief, the loss of a father, a husband, or a grandfather, an uncle, whatever it can be. These are hard traditions to reflect on because even if they had lots of wisdom, it's possible life wasn't kind to them. Sometimes Proverbs doesn't always work out the way we want it to. Sometimes they don't always get to have the gray hair we wish they would have. Today I reflect on my grandfather's death. He thankfully died of an old age, but I know that's not the case for everyone. I would still miss him dearly. What we can be confident, though, is that these faithful people of God who raised us with our Father in heaven in their minds is a reality. It is not something we speculate. We truly believe it because we know it with our hearts for the Holy Spirit. So we thank those fathers today. And all these grandfathers, and despite all the turmoil each generation underwent, all the different current events that went happened, they refused to falter and fall into the chaos of the world around them. And as we pray, let we remember all those lessons, love, and joyful memories that they have given us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are truly our Father in heaven and in our hearts. We thank you loved your family so much that you chose your son to die on the cross for the atonement of our sins and so that you yourself father might fill that void in our hearts that we might have new life with you in the center of it with a community and a family we call the body of christ let us reflect and thank our fathers and all these other father figures in our lives who took over those roles necessary when no one else was there lord we need a father you are there to fill that void let us remember our families, our fathers, our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers, all of these people who provide so much wisdom, setting examples, and providing that much-needed joy and that shield in what feels like a chaotic world. For those who are struggling with today, Father, I ask that you give them that peace and understanding that those fathers are not gone but are secure in your salvation, that you too are still our Father, giving us that godly wisdom and setting that discipline, standard, and example through the stories of your son. I thank you for today. In Christ's name, amen. We're now say page 98. We ought to be in here.
from a father, a father figure, or even just from scripture, or even a, a pastor who has acted as a father figure in your life. Reflect on that wisdom this week, and just give thanks to the Lord that he has disciplined you in that way. May you have a blessed Sunday and rest of your week.